Hello, I'm Irene Natividad, President of the Global Summit of Women, which will be taking place in Bangkok, Thailand, October 8 to 10. I hope you can come and join us there. But until then, I want to bring the summit to you. One of our key sessions are the skills building sessions. And today we're going to take a look at win-win negotiations. The reason for that is learning how to negotiate or to negotiate well is very important in terms of our business and economic careers. There was a study by the Congressional Budget Office in the United States looking at pay equity, why does that exist? And basically their bottom line was women don't negotiate and they have to learn how to do it from the beginning, from when they first get hired and all the way up. Whatever it is, negotiating with your clients, with your supervisor, with your colleagues, with whomever. It's a very essential part of being a successful um, businesswoman. So today, we are very fortunate to have an expert in this arena. She is Dr. Selena Realuyo. She is a diplomat who has had to negotiate in conflict-ridden uh, areas. She's currently a full professor at the National Defense University here in the United States. And I have to tell you, there are very few women who hold that kind of position, let alone that rank. Um, so let us welcome Dr. Selena Realuyo. So Selena, welcome. Um, why is it that women are scared of negotiations? Why do they dread it? Why don't they do more of it? So first, thank you so much, Irene, for inviting me to uh, discuss what has been a real challenge throughout many women's career, and it is a truly vital skill set, negotiating and negotiating well. Women actually shouldn't dread negotiations because we do it all the time. So right now, under the pandemic, we're negotiating with our husbands and our children, dealing with household chores. And in the work setting, daily, we negotiate with our coworkers, our supervisors, and our employees on how to divide and assign the workload. Whether it's buying a car, buying a house, negotiating for a promotion, a raise, or perhaps acquiring a new business. Uh, negotiating is literally a vital skill set um, that is actually useful throughout your life. So for me, actually, the best class I ever took at Harvard Business School that I use still every day uh, is uh, how to negotiate. Um, but I'm sure that, Irene, you have other questions as well regarding this important topic. Well, I do. So how should women approach negotiations? Is it different from the way men should, or is it about the same? What are the basic techniques? Sure. So actually, we should negotiate just like men do. If you think about it, it's like uh, sports, where there are the same rules and regulations. It's just how much practice and how much preparation you put into it will determine your level, uh, for example, in that sport. So first and most importantly, you really should devote time to prepare and research. Doing your homework to understand uh, perhaps the value, if you're actually going in to negotiate for a raise, you should know what the going rate is um, in your sector at your level. And then more importantly, you should understand what the other side's interests and objectives are. The more educated you are about who you're negotiating with, what their constraints, and more importantly, what resources they have, puts you in a better and stronger position to negotiate. The other thing we're always focusing on is having a positive mental attitude and an optimistic outlook when you go in to negotiate. That first 30 seconds of your presence will actually set the tone for any negotiations. Um, while there's some debate, I really truly believe that you should make your offer first. And this is particularly true for women because this actually prevents you from getting lowballed, especially when it comes to a negotiation that has to do with salary or perhaps the acquisition price of a company. What you'll see as well is that you need to learn what the other side, uh, his, his or her objective is. And that's why we actually advise that you try to listen more than actually speak, which for me is actually a big challenge. We usually use the 70-30 rule where you're listening and actively listening 70% and then speaking 30% usually responding. Why is this? 
you elicit a lot of clues and information about the position and the interests that the other side is trying to advocate. And that gives you time as well in order to reformulate uh, your counter offers if it comes to that. Then lastly, in terms of techniques, you really need to go into any negotiation prepared to walk away. And you need to have options that are really available and more importantly, that you would be able to pursue if the negotiation falls apart. And then more importantly, uh, you wouldn't be devastated by it walking away. So those are kind of the techniques that we use regardless of the setting. And of course you tailor them depending on the culture, the corporate culture. But this is important for whether you work in government um, or as an entrepreneur or in the corporate uh, kind of environment. But it's even more important, and as we are here speaking with members of the Global Summit of Women, you really have to invest time to understand the cultural norms of where you're going to be negotiating and with whom you're negotiating. In the United States, we spend a lot of time negotiating thinking it's a one-step process, when actually in other cultures, it takes a lot of time to warm up to the other side. And whether that's actually going to share a meal or understanding about people's families before you get down to business. And that's one of the things that we've seen in terms of styles that are very different from the American context. But I'm sure you have other questions for me as well, Ivy. Well, you know, when you, when you were talking about styles, how should you walk into a negotiation? How do you make this, you know, my understanding is in negotiations, both sides must win, must feel like they're winning. So, you know, what are the components of that? And if you can give examples, that would, that would be great. Thanks. Sure, so classically, we've always looked at, and more importantly, history is taught this way in terms of conflict, which is an area that I work on um, in my daily life, uh, teaching the future generals, admirals, and ambassadors of the world. It's looking at the world in a zero sum game, that there's a winner or a loser. But what we're talking about today is how to engage in win-win negotiations. What does that mean? That means that actually your counterpart leaves the day, not as your adversary, but they need to feel as if they've gotten something out of the negotiation. So how do you do that? First, you have to depersonalize the entire process. And that's so important to separate people from actually what the problem is. And then we also have to actually manage our emotions. And this is where I've seen that uh, many uh, very uh, seasoned negotiators try to manipulate the emotions of their counterparts to either make them feel either vulnerable or unsure of their positions. So this is where you need to divorce your emotions from actual criteria that is fact-based. And then most importantly, you have to find every opportunity to generate mutual gain opportunities. And this is where that concept of win-win is super important. So let's say that you're going into um, a negotiation to acquire another company. And more importantly, when you acquire that company, there's going to be about a year of that integration of that merger and acquisition that's gonna take place. What you need to do is to make the other side feel that you've made concessions, even though you're the company that's going to acquire the other, that's going to make the transition as painless and as productive as possible. And a lot of this has to do, as you mentioned, with your mental attitude and how you compose yourself. And this is where it's so important, that piece of preparation and doing your homework, understanding, empathizing with the other side's interests and concerns is really quite important. Each situation is gonna be different. And also, just to be realistic, it's not always gonna be a win-win negotiation. But those are the types of things that we take a look at. There are actually five different negotiating styles. The one that you're most um, perhaps kind of uh, familiar with is the competing one, where someone wins and someone loses. The other one is collaboration. The other one is actually compromising, and that tends to be more in the win-win space. Accommodating, and then the last one, which is actually avoiding. Each negotiation is unique, even if it's in the same industry or a very similar situation. And the people who are gonna be at the table are very different. And you need to be able to read what they're signaling within that very first uh, maybe five minutes of a negotiation 
to better understand and listen to their concerns. So those are the types of things and ingredients that we usually associate with a win-win negotiation, I think. Thank you. Um, negotiating is very, uh, how do you say this, uh, ask producing. <laughs> You know, I don't think anyone goes into it feeling terrific that, you know, I'm going to get all of it. So what are some mistakes, some common mistakes that women make? Um, for instance, you know, when you're going to ask for a raise or a promotion, uh, which is the most likely use for a lot of our women, um, what are things we should remember and avoid uh, if possible? Sure. So I think the most important thing is to actually figure out how you will defend the position um, in terms of what your value is. And this is where we've seen, and it's been documented through a lot of um, uh, kind of research and psychology that women tend to leave what we call money on the table. And why is this? Because in many occasions, we actually see that women seem satisfied with the next notch up in terms of uh, that raise that they expected of maybe 10% as opposed to trying to go for the next level, which is 20%. This is so interesting. When I was a banker on Wall Street with Goldman Sachs, it was amazing how the men would go in and basically lobby for a project or lobby for a promotion who were far less qualified than their female peers, but they were bold enough to raise their hand and ask. And I think we have now a generation of women who are doing the same thing um, inspired by um, this idea of leaning in and sitting at the table, but we need to actually practice what we preach on every occasion. What we also know is that um, you're more persuasive when you bring facts and figures to the table. So when I do negotiations, whether it's through um, government negotiations or a salary uh, or a promotion, I actually keep a notebook with me and I actually do my homework and put together, for example, at our competitor, they're paying this. And this is very important in terms of being able to bring information that's objective from the outside to help defend your position and your cause and to do it in a persuasive, in an assertive manner, but not an aggressive manner. And this is where it's so important to basically strike that balance between being confident, being assertive without actually antagonizing. But we've actually seen that the more data you can bring to the table to determine and more importantly defend your wealth and value is so important, especially in this day and age where we're going to be encountering a lot of uh, economic challenges post-pandemic. Irene? Yes. Um, forget to come back in. Um, it's always easier to say, um, do this, do that, but there's a point when it just isn't working. When you sort of hit an impasse, uh, what do you do then? Um, I, I am guilty of bad things like walking out, <laughs> you know, uh, on one occasion at a meeting at the UN when I was just hit my ceiling. What would you say in that situation? How do we handle that? So first of all, you need to be ready to uh, understand that an impasse can take place. And what's even more frightening is when they walk out on you. So you have to be in a mental mode to be flexible and adaptable. But what's most important, we always talk about it, is what is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? It's called BATNA for those who take actual negotiations courses. And this is the idea that even if the negotiation fails, I am okay with walking away and I have other options. So for example, let's say you are actually negotiating for a promotion at your current firm. And for some reason they've chosen someone else or more importantly, you've gone in to lobby for that promotion to be the head of that marketing unit. And it doesn't work out. But usually in this day and age, you're working with uh, headhunters or others who can basically explore options with similar roles at competitors. And that's something that we've actually seen because human capital is the most valuable asset of any company or any institution. They would rather keep you on and then actually pay 
uh, and promote you to the adequate level than actually have to rehire someone who is an unknown quantity. So that's really important to know. Plus it's okay. This is something that we've actually tried to educate um, both sides, men and women, that if you hit an impasse, it is perfectly okay to take a break. And this is actually done when you're looking at very complex trade negotiations or diplomatic negotiations, being able to take a break is actually healthy. And you should actually never be in a negotiation for more than one or two hours just because of the mental drain. What also is quite important is some people use this tactic of taking a break in order to regroup. So this is where you actually go back, really understand, and through your notes, go through, where can I find an area of mutual gain in order to overcome the impasse? Each situation is different. And most importantly, it's important to, uh, to really focus on listening to what the other side is willing to offer. And usually when you've taken a break, whether it's about 15 minutes or an hour or some days, this idea of coming back to the table will show political will on both sides to actually resolve the problem. Um, but you should be prepared that you'll actually hit an impasse because it happens more than you would expect. Irene? Well, how some women just have one shot at meeting with their supervisor or HR and to, you know, do a pause may not be possible. So should you have a plan B, you know, in mind as to if I can't do this, I'm still okay because I'm here or should you try to negotiate for something else? So it depends on your actual situation, but you should always have whether it's having uh, done informational interviews with competitors in your same sector and your same space to actually also bring that in as kind of an ultimatum. Now, what's very important, if you're gonna use threats and ultimatums uh, with your current supervisor, you have to be uh, prepared to assume the consequences if they call your bluff. Uh, right now in a very competitive corporate um, landscape, we see there are uh, active headhunters across the panorama who are looking for talents. And then more importantly, if you're confident with your skill set, uh, and more importantly, you are your own product and you need to market yourself and your skills in the best way possible. And in certain places, you'll see that, well, you've actually outgrown your position. And it might be that that conversation will prompt you to look elsewhere. And we've actually seen many women start their own businesses, whether it's consulting firms or marketing firms, after they had kind of actually outgrown uh, the corporate structure that they had been inhabiting for so many years, and then hit that kind of glass ceiling that we've talked about for many years, Irene. Thank you, Selena. This is actually a, indeed a very, very difficult time because a lot of people are wanting to come back and they may not be asked to come back. So those skills that you've outlined will probably be necessary for people to justify their continued employment. So now uh, we're ready for some questions to uh, Selena. I'm sure we have many from wherever. I think we have one from Atlanta. Hi, Cindy. Hi, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Irene, for, for hosting this. I am uh, Cindy Pace with MetLife and we are a global diversified insurance services firm. So one of the questions that I have is going back to what you were talking about, touched on in terms of the cultural differences. If you're in a situation where you're negotiating and there may be some difference in cultural backgrounds or cultural styles, what would you recommend someone do to prepare in advance for that exchange, knowing that there are some cultural differences at play? So nowadays, we're really um, blessed to have so many resources uh, through the magic of the internet to understand uh, corporate cultures. And it's not just even cultural cultures in terms of different parts of the world. It's actually what that different sector is. So I know you're from insurance, Cindy, so that's got its own corporate culture. I think you'd agree with me um, in terms of that. So it's not just taking a look at the country in which you're going to be negotiating, but it's how that industry operates inside that country. And then more importantly, it's all about cues. 
What's very helpful is to actually seek out, and we have a wonderful network through the Global Summit of Women, of women that we can reach out to who may not be at the company that you're trying to negotiate with, but who is from, let's say, Thailand, which will host the Global Summit this year, who will help you with, usually you're going to have to go through three different stages of getting to know the person you're um, going to be negotiating with. This is something that's very true in Latin America and Asia, as you know. But more importantly, why is it different in your industry in that country? So that's where we come back to this idea. You really can't prepare enough ahead of the negotiation. And this is where we see a lot of shortfalls where people just assume that it's done the same way. And as we become more globalized and more culturally sensitive, we have to also understand the perceptions. So I spent a lot of time in the Middle East and in Latin America, where still there is machismo, where it's um, you'll have to work three times harder, right, in order to actually get your point across, just because of those perceptions. And the more aware that you are before that negotiation of how you will be perceived, the better, better armed and equipped you'll be with being able to present and understand the context. So hopefully that helps you. Thanks for your question. Thank you. And I think we have another question from actually from Bangkok. Hi, Selena. Hi, Nock. Thank you so much for a great presentation. My name is Dr. Chonchanok Wirawan, or you can call me Nock. I'm a past international president of BPW International, which is a woman organization with uh, over 100 member countries. So my question to you here is, how would you advise in terms of um, negotiating with people who already set their mind on certain decision? Okay, it's like uh, they already know that they want to, things to go that way. And then uh, they're not in that part willing to listen that much. So that's, actually, uh, that, yes. yeah. so that's actually probably the greatest challenge. And that becomes a bigger problem when you're looking at kind of global international trade or diplomatic negotiations, because each side is actually dug in on their position. So what's super important, Nock, is that we have to use our power of persuasion to better understand, and this is where that 70% listening and 30% um, speaking comes in handy, to see if there's some way we could construct something that would be a win-win. So if there's one area where both sides would agree, perhaps there's a little place, an area where we can, a wedge, where we can actually drive in and try to gain uh, some positioning. Each negotiation is distinct, but more importantly, I know what you're feeling and more importantly, your, your uh, concern, because sometimes, even though they say they are going to maintain their position, you'll be surprised through talking it out and sharing interests and sharing concerns, they will actually see why it is beneficial to them to negotiate and give some in the hopes that you're actually gonna grow the pie as opposed to just doing um, uh, what we call a zero sum game where there's only one winner and one loser. And that's the whole point of today's session is taking a look at win-win negotiations. It's not gonna work in every situation, but you wanna try to be in a position where you build mutual agreements, and then more importantly, come away with that both sides are not actually adversaries, you're collaborators in trying to solve a problem. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. And the next question is from Europe and it's from Paris. Yes, thank you very much. Hi, Irene. Hi, Selina. Thank Hi. you very much. It's very, very interesting. I'm really I'm impressed. Um, I'm Elizabeth Richard. I'm in charge of women uh, communities in France. I'm a, a co-chair of the Global Summit of Women France. And I've got a question for you. My question might be a little bit caricatural. Uh, anyway, I wanted your, your point on this. I feel that negotiating uh, in a globalization way is more a question of men than, than with uh, local solutions, which is more uh, um, where uh, women are more in harmony with that. I wanted your feeling and your point on your point of view on this. 
globalization, local solutions, big market, yeah. small markets, you know, right. with the coronavirus, we see that things are changing and women are taking the power on this. So we've actually seen, um, and there's research to prove that women are more, have more emotional intelligence. I don't know if you know that concept, that we actually understand and sense, and more importantly, at another level. It's not just the basic math of is there profit or loss, but the actual context. And we're, uh, the, the course I teach is actually globalization and national security. And this year, I think I have to call it deglobalization because of the pandemic. So we didn't talk about it that much. And it's a tragic um, fact that in the United States, we've just reached 100,000 uh, deaths due to the coronavirus. But what we're seeing are local solutions and most importantly, the prominence of women who are actually dealing with the virus at the forefront as doctors and nurses and first responders, but even more so the, what we call the mental wellness of the community. And I think this is where we're gonna to have to start understanding how the pandemic, even though it technically kills more men than women, we're seeing very detrimental and frightening effects on women, um, where women are still the key uh, uh, head of household who are also working. And with the pandemic now, it's something I started with. It's amazing how many of my friends are now fighting with their husbands because the husbands had no idea how much it uh, took to manage the household now that they're at the house and not traveling as McKinsey consultants around the world. So what we're seeing though too is how could you bring that awareness and sensitivity of problem solving at that micro level to the more global level. And I think it's fantastic to see that the countries who have uh, really led the pandemic response more effectively are actually women than men. Uh, we want everyone to succeed to overcome the invisible enemy that's the virus. Um, that's not just harming us health-wise, but it's doing a detriment to our economy. And this is something that we're going to take a look at. Uh, so we hope that uh, uh, everyone stays well, but more importantly, each one of us can contribute through our household, through our community, through our businesses, in finding solutions that are local at the same time they're actually international. And this is what we're hoping that uh, countries that have managed this pandemic much better than others will start to share their best practices and lessons learned um, in order to actually uh, kind of mitigate the negative effects of uh, COVID-19. Irene. Well, thank you, Selena, for all the excellent advice. And thank you to our questioners for bringing out points that, you know, Selena uh, enlarged upon. Um, this is a terrific time for us to be able to learn how to negotiate both at home and at work and at return to work. So thank you all for being here. Uh, Global Summit of Women will be in Bangkok October 8th to 10th. I look forward to seeing you then. There will be resources that will be available um, on our website and which we will also send to all of you who want to have something to read to follow up on Selena's presentation. Thank you again, Dr. Realuyo. Thank you for being part of this and to all of you have a wonderful day.